Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified coach and midlife mentor. And I'm so glad to be here with you for this week's episode, which is an interview with someone who followed her passion and started an exciting new business that was a perfect match and complement to what she loved. I'm thrilled to have Dorothy Mazo on the podcast today to talk about reimagining your home and home sharing as an empty nester. So are you curious about planning ahead for empty nest, pre-retirement, retirement, or just midlife in general? You might just be sitting in and on a gold mine. My guest today is Dorothy Mazo, founder of Golden Home Sharing Connections and its online database, Golden Girls Canada. And if you're like me, you probably remember the TV show, The Golden Girls, What a fun idea it was to live with your cool girlfriends. Remember how nice that place was? Oh my gosh. I mean, it was so Florida and it was really, really fun. Well, it turns out that home sharing is a viable, affordable and doable option, especially as an empty nester in midlife and beyond. Drawing on more than 20 years of living in shared homes, Dorothy wanted to help others learn how this way of living can add years to your life and life to your years. A longtime community advocate, former architect, and practicing realtor, Dorothy has blended her skills and talents to create an encore business for herself in a way that makes profound difference for all. Home sharing really is viable and affordable, and it's an awesome way to live. It's super fun. Whether you're an empty nester with some empty rooms in your house, or maybe you're ready to co-purchase with some trusted friends, or maybe even you're starting to think about downsizing and what your options are, you got to look at home sharing as a way to gain companionship and help around the house, cut expenses, and know that somebody has your back in an emergency. There's a huge need for affordable housing as we age, and there's also a huge resource that's rarely considered, and it's something like this. The other reason I was so interested in talking to Dorothy is that, like I mentioned, She is a great example of somebody who followed her passion. Launching this business was a natural extension of what she loved to think about, which is how to help communities thrive. She changed her career several times throughout her life. And you'll see that like so many of my guests on the Women in the Middle podcast, she was always on the right path. Everything she did and what she was always fascinated about made total sense in terms of her inspiration to start this business. You're going to love learning about this interesting possibility for how to use your home differently now or in the future. So don't miss this interview. Hi, Dorothy. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Women in the Middle podcast. Thank you, Susie. I am so excited to talk to you for a couple of reasons. One, I pride myself in being able to sniff out a good story. And when you told me about what you were doing, I was delighted because I saw right away your career path story and discovering your passion is part of what's going on with you. And then also the way you developed this business idea is fascinating for women our age. So let's start by just telling us a a little bit about your career history, where you started and what it looked like for you getting older, getting into your 50s and beyond. Okay. Well, uh, actually, when I turned 50, I think I have a common story that a lot of your guests will recognize. I've been practicing architecture for close to 30 years. I got my degree in architecture and I've been practicing it. And uh, 50 years old, I got laid off. I can totally relate to that. (laughs) Same thing happened to me. (laughs) I puttered around, tried to sort of practice architecture, but I really didn't want to do it on my own. I didn't want to found a practice. I actually did a stint in construction for about four months right after I left my previous job. And that kind of turned my head around. And I felt like I could do anything at that point. And so I kind of realized that what my passion was had to do a lot with with community. And I was very interested in co-housing, which is a way that people can develop their own communities. It's really a development project taken on by a group of individuals. 
happening more in the States and on the West Coast of Canada, uh, still trying to get it going here in Ontario. But it's a long haul and it takes deep pockets and it wasn't something that I could just carry on forever. Well, tell so, me, but how did you even figure that out? Because first of all, I can't stop thinking about Mike Brady. As soon as you said you were an architect, I'm like the Brady Bunch architect. You're going to take your family to Hawaii. You're going to do all the architect things that Mike Brady did. Sorry, I can't help myself. I always have a Brady Bunch reference, but <laughs> <laughs> that's OK. I've never watched the show, so I'm innocent. <laughs> what? I can't even believe it. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, somebody out there is laughing right now. We can't believe sure. it. He was a very famous architect on okay. TV, on TV. Um, in, in, in the land of yeah. television in our childhood. Right. Um, OK, so you you got laid off. And while you were an architect, did you notice that you were particularly interested in community as you were building your career? Uh, well, yes, I was always thinking about ways that people could could uh, sh- have homes that were close together. Um, and uh, interact with each other. And that's where co-housing really caught my eye because that's where it's really intentional. It's people coming together to build a community on a social, emotional level, as well as on a physical level. And it's a uh, really long haul. It's really, you're building your sweat equity and you really develop a passion for it. And, so, what, so what do you mean? Like, you mean that you have to work with builders and you need to sell the idea to people who own mm-hmm. land or is that what yeah. you're doing? Uh, well, that as an architect and as someone, I was meeting with groups who were interested in doing co-housing, oh. and, and I know I'm familiar with the development pro- uh, process in general. So the idea was to educate people about the development process, the steps that they have to take to do this. Oh my gosh! Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm like right. I'm like, what is she talking about? This is very <laughs> unusual for me. I'm just like a okay. homeowner. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then, what happened? Well, um, I realized that I wasn't able to get that off the ground the way I wanted to. So I realized I had to do something to um, earn some money. So I realized, well, I'll get into real estate because that's sort of working in a similar related field. It has gives me a more flexible schedule. As an architect, I mean, I wasn't taking my family to Hawaii. I was either at a drafting board or I was on a construction site. So, or I was meeting with clients. So it wasn't right. really getting at what I wanted, especially after all this time of being on my own, having left the previous position. So I got my real estate license. And, and how old were you when you did that? Uh, I was about, about 54, I think, when I got my real estate license. Okay, so that's, a pretty, that. that's a pretty big shift. And, and what was going on in your home life at that time? Uh, well, already I was home sharing, which is something we'll get into later, which actually really gave me the flexibility to make these kind of changes because I didn't have to worry as much financially in fact, uh, one of my housemates, when I was still looking at co-housing, um, her, she was a widow who had a, her husband, her late husband had been an Air Canada pilot. And so I was thinking, well, how can I get to the West Coast where all this co-housing is happening when I don't, I'm getting unemployment insurance, all of the, you know, I'm trying to save my resources. She said, well, uh, why don't you come as my companion? Because as a Air Canada widow, she could fly anywhere in the world on Air Canada at no cost, and she could bring a companion with her. Oh, that's so interesting. And you were a single parent? I was a single parent. At that point, my son was pretty well, had left the nest. He was well launched and uh, he's, he's doing really well. So it was really me with uh, this woman who was a widow and her daughter, who was a little bit younger than me. The, the, this lady was a little bit older than me. Uh, that's a whole, I mean, I shared a home with them for 20, well, 20 years, really, with the daughter, especially. Wow. So you were introduced. Yeah. To this, con- you loved this concept personally and professionally. It really started to, um, I guess, probably just ooze into every part of your mind. You're probably thinking about it all the time. Yeah, it was just a natural part of me. That's why when I launched my present business, it was as a as a realtor looking at a lot of my clients who a, a lot with the uh, seniors real estate specialist designation. A lot of people looking to downsize. Um, but, but I was realizing that there's not a lot of good solutions for people who are trying to downsize from their family home. Because if you want to buy a smaller home, right away you're competing against all the first-time buyers. And that's pushing prices up. At the same time, you can't sell your own home for that much because there's not as much demand for them. So there goes your nest egg. You, know, you really get squeezed. And then there's retirement homes, which are like three to $5,000 a year to start with. And if you need more services to go up. Oh, you and- mean a month, right? Yeah, a month. Sorry, oh, a month. Yeah, a, month. <laughs> a year. That would be yeah. a major good deal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wishful so, thinking. Good one. Good one. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, three to five thousand a month. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and of course, you know, forget nursing homes. No one wants to go to nursing homes. I mean, that's like a very last resort. And um, 
Yeah, so I realized that I'd been living the answer, that I'd been sh sharing homes for so many years that it was, as you say, it was like second nature to me. I didn't even think about it. So, but, but how a, did that happen? Like, so you were a companion and you got yourself to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And is it the other woman who had the idea? Uh, to go to, to, to move in, idea? to move in together. Uh, well, she, well, I had been sharing a home with her daughter, actually. There were oh. several women sharing a big house in the country, which she really loved. Oh, wow. And, um, one of the roommates, her mother was going to be buying another house. And I think her mother at that point was 72, which is just about what I am now. But um, she knew that she was going to need her daughter on the mortgage with her because you know, at 72, it's hard to get a long-term mortgage. So her daughter said, well, sure, mom, I'm happy to come, but uh, can I invite my housemates? Because we really like each other and we're having, you know, good time. Um, and so several of us said, sure, we, we know your mom. We love your mom. You know, this could work well. Um, and for various reasons, the house that they could get was really big enough for just three people. So for various reasons, it was me. So that's how we started sharing. Wow. That's fascinating. Because right away, I'm like, this sounds risky. This sounds risky. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're, you're all in. <laughs> yeah, I am, you know, and uh, you have to be careful about it. And again, I, I think because I'm all in, I've been doing it for so long. A lot of the things that I teach people about how to share a home uh, really involve a little more caution, a little more intentionality and, and so forth. But I've kind of been looking at that, you know, as I go forward. Oh my gosh, good. I definitely want to talk about that. But so tell me, what is the, uh, what happened then that you ended up developing this current business? Okay. Well, as I say, I was finding that um, you know, the solutions out there for people who are downsizing really weren't that great. And that home sharing could be a great answer for them. And, and think uh, the Golden Girls TV show in the 1980s. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, perfect, perfect. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> and um, yeah, so I thought, well, someone suggested, well, I could, I could launch a business where I'm taking, you know, my vulnerable older clients and finding a younger person to share with them. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of liability in being that hands-on. I said, there are agencies that do that. I'm one person. I can't be looking after everybody. But I'd like to do something like a, like a dating site, you know, for people that are still active and able-bodied and forward-looking can sign up and talk about themselves and how they like to live. And people that are looking for an affordable place to live can join and talk about themselves and how they like to live. And then they can talk to each other. And so I do workshops to sort of show people how to do that. And I that do is, yeah. That is such a breakthrough idea. It really is. Uh, I have never heard of anything like that. Usually when somebody's looking to cohabitate with somebody, it's a big mystery. Like you're answering an ad. You don't know anything about the other person. I have a friend who relocated to a different province um, a year or two ago, and she was looking at that option, but it just seemed so daunting and so overwhelming, kind of like a crapshoot. Well, I know it's a... I guess like a dating site, people do actually do get married, having met on dating sites. It's happening. Yeah. So, you know, why not find a housemate this way? Now, uh, again, Brilliant. yeah, going on Kijiji or, or Craigslist, yeah, it is a bit of a crapshoot. And you might get 300 responses and you have no idea who these people are. Um, there, there is a woman who in the States uh, who has written a book on sharing housing. And she's someone that also had been sharing homes herself for many, many years. And uh, a friend kind of approached her at one point saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I just got a divorce and I've got this house. And, and she said, look, you know, why don't you do what I'm doing and share it? And this person says, I don't even know how to where to start. So she wrote a book called Sharing Housing, which I actually have available on my website. Oh, awesome. And yeah, and that, but that also got, got me into the idea of starting workshops because it's one thing to know what, what sharing housing is. And, and home sharing is, my friend Anne-Marie in the States has coined the word home, homemate as opposed to housemate. And the way she defines a homemate is someone that you like, first of all, and you respect them. You know they're a good person. And your lifestyles are compatible enough that you're comfortable living together. So it's not just a superficial rent arrangement. It no. really is a lifestyle choice that you enjoy. Yes, it is. A housemate implies you're under the same roof, but you're totally going your separate ways, almost like a boarding house, which this is not meant to be like a boarding house. This is meant to be almost like a, a surrogate family you know, that you come together. You still have your own lives and you still are independent financially other than the household costs. So right there, it's something like a lot of marriages, people are really tied together in terms of finances. Or in this, this case- is, Dorothy, I can't yeah. even tell you, this is fascinating to me. It really is. What I love about this topic is that 
it's not just a solution for somebody who is ready to downsize, but it's also a solution to think about for a while when you're in the transitional phase of being newly divorced or widowed, having a fresh empty nest, or finding yourself um, suddenly single for, I don't know, all kinds of reasons with Mm -hmm. moving someplace else. Things happen. So, I can see that this is the type of thing where you might think about for a while and learn about for a while, kind of like when you want to invest in a condo and you don't know anything about investing in condos. Mm -hmm. You think about it for a while. You do your research. I can see how this would kind of get stuck in your head on the back burner Mm -hmm. and you'd be thinking, 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 because as you mentioned in some of the material I saw on your website, there's quite a need. You shared some pretty interesting statistics about the need out there. Let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. Well, I think probably the, the, the blog you're referring to is the one where I talk about the 5 million spare bedrooms oh, in Ontario. Yes. <laughs> 5, uh, million 5 million spare bedrooms. That is unbelievable. Yeah. I, I, I tracked down the report that that came from, and sure enough, there it was. And what they also said in this report is that's equal to 24 years worth of affordable housing construction. Wow. Yeah. Now, is the province going to even be able to do that? And I'm not only financially, but just think of what that does to the environment if they have to build all that housing. Whereas if you can find people that you like, and it could be people that you already know. I mean, you have great friends, and maybe those great friends that you like and respect are compatible housemates, but maybe they would drive you crazy if you tried to live with them. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Well, and I know you're going, we're going to talk about how you can figure that out, but Another one of the um, stats that you mentioned that the National Center for Family and Marriage Research in the States was that one out of three boomers will probably face older years without a spouse. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure that's similar in Canada. I know so many people that have gone through divorces, separations, you know, early, early widowhood, which is a real shock because you never expect that. Yeah. And I guess the thing is, too, that when you end up in this situation and you don't even know if you're going to like being single and living single or not. But for the women I've spoken to about it, it's quite an adjustment. Mm-hmm. Yep. And some people do get married again. That's something that they want to do and that's what they do and that's fine. But there's other people that, that they really would rather not do that. I know when I separated from my husband, I did move in with a, another friend who had some kids. And when my son was young, he went, we shared with a couple of different people. Uh, sharing childcare is a whole different dynamic because you have to have similar uh, philosophy about how you raise your kids and so forth. Uh, but my son, uh, he, I say he turned out okay. <laughs> He's quite a well-adjusted adult. He went through his adolescence actually living with, with, uh, with me and two other adult women in his house. So oh. uh, yeah, he, he, he does, he is, he's married now and he's been married 14 years. So it seems to be working. Wow. That's so interesting. So So people, uh, many people are sitting on an amazing opportunity and it's not just a financial opportunity, but socially it can be really rewarding. And I think what's happening now in the pandemic is we're more, we're appreciating even limited social contact and support more than ever before, because so many people living alone are so isolated and we don't even have work to go to right now. Most, so many people are working at home even if they didn't choose to work at home. So it's really quite a situation that I think will uh, really prepare people to be open to what you're offering. So tell us a little bit about this matching service. How does it work? Okay. Uh, well, basically, uh, if you, you become a member and there is a, a profile that you'd fill out, one for if you're a home sharer, the home to share, and one if you're someone that's looking for a place to live. And even before becoming a member, there's a drop down menu that's search for a housemate and you can search for either whichever side you're looking for. And you can see their, their username, not their real name, but their username, how much they, they are charging or ability to pay. And that's negotiable, I think, always. And where they're located, if they're in Toronto, if they're in Etobicoke. And it is available across Canada, but because I am basically located in Ontario, most people, folks are around here. Um, but as well as the basics, like uh, do you need public transportation? Do you need a place to park? Uh, is, do you allow smoking, pets, alcohol, you know, those sort of basic kind of questions. Uh, I think there's a thing, what age range are you? And I overlap the age ranges, the youngest one being under 50. And then I go 40 to 60, 50 to 70, um, 60 to 80. And that's because people really age differently. I mean, 
you yes, they do. Yeah. So you may identify more, you know, if you're 70 years old, are you more like closer to a 60? But you don't want to be 70 to 90 because you're certainly not like a 90 year old. So that's why I say 60 to 80. Okay. I'm comfortable in there. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. And I'm always saying, people are saying, well, what they ask me, what is midlife really? And I'm, well, you know, it's a combination of age and stage. Like it really is a mindset thing. Mm-hmm. It's what you make it mean and how you identify. And uh, that's a great point. So asking people like that with flexibility on the form, perfect. Yeah. And then after you sort of the checklist you go through, there's up to, you could write up to 500 words about how you like to live. What's important to you? How you, you know, what you're like, do you travel a lot? Are you home a lot? Do you entertain a lot? Um, you know, and then what are you looking for in the house? The physical part. I need a, a room. I need an office space as well. Um, and the homeowner, are you sharing the kitchen? And are you sharing a bathroom? Is it a private bathroom? That kind of thing. And one point that I do make to people is that if you are sharing either a kitchen or a bathroom with your house space, your homemates, then you are not under regulated by the Residential Tenancies Act, which for the homeowner, that means if a serious situation arises and you need someone to leave, you can just ask them to go and they they have to go, which is another reason you really need to have a written agreement that says, Mm -hmm. If in case of this happens or this happens, the homemate has like 90 days to find someplace. Because legally at this point, unless you have a written agreement, uh, then you could be out on the street, which is just not fair. And you don't want that situation to arise. And where do people find, I'm sure you, you review this in your workshops, but mm-hmm. where do people find this information? I know it's different in every province, but is it usually yeah. a, a, a local government office? Uh, yeah. In, in Ontario, I guess the Ministry of Housing would probably be the, the overriding one. Um, and whatever your housing authority is, and there'll be probably some kind of residential tenancies legislation. So, you know, I caution people, if you have a basement apartment to rent, that's great, but just be really, really careful because there are professional tenants out there that know how to work the system. So, yeah, even if, even if you're going to rent a basement apartment, I certainly advise people to be really careful. Check references. Always check references, check ability to pay, um, get a credit check done. You know, there is actually a company that will do background checks for you called neighborly.ca. I talk about that in my workshops. And they will do a back, they won't, they will do a background check, credit check, employment check. They will not do the, the telephone calls for personal references. You still have to do that. But that's important to do because you want to talk to people that know this person that might move in with you. Right. So would you say that this is one of the barriers to overcome if you're seriously looking at this option? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are things to, th- to think about. But again, I've been doing this for so long, it almost like a, a no brainer. But, you know, clearly, you do have to be careful. But I do have as part of the workshop and, um, and for members as well, there is a checklist on how to write a, a home sharing agreement. And there's also one for if you want to co purchase a place, because that's something else people can do. If you have some friends, and generally speaking, it's people you know. Wow. So uh, it's so fun that you mentioned Golden Girls, because everybody has such a great thought right away when it's about the Golden Girls. It was so much fun and they really enjoyed living together. And do you find that um, the kitchen situation and the bathroom situation are the things that need to really be thought through? Uh, Definitely so. Yeah. I mean, that's one question someone always asks me when I mentioned that I'm sharing homes with someone. Well, how do you handle the kitchen? I said, well, we cook in it. (laughs) (laughs) And the way I've always done it, even when I was in university, sharing homes with three other other art students because I was studying architecture. Um, you know, we shopped groceries together and we cooked together and I still have some recipes I use that I learned from them. And we cleaned house sort of as students do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And so always when I've shared homes with people, we've just uh, we've shopped and we sort of keep track. We kept a list every month. You know, when you bought something, you wrote it down. At the end of the month, you added it all up and divide by two or three or four. Um, and then you settle up. And, but, but other people do it differently. Other people have, okay, this is your corner of the fridge and this is my corner of the fridge. And maybe we'll have a kitty to buy the paper towels and the toilet paper and you know, the household stuff. So this, you accept it up different ways, but it's all things you have to talk about ahead of time. Wow. So what, what do you think makes a good homemate? Because I would imagine that this thing, this idea isn't great for everyone. Uh, no, certainly if you're a hermit, if you don't like other people around, uh, or you're very, very extremely private, it probably wouldn't work for you. But if you're open to the idea of, um, you know, if you like to share other things or if you'd like to go places with people and you're fairly sociable, um, yeah, it can can really work, but you have to make sure people are on the same page. 
Like if you're a real neat freak, you want to make sure that the people that you have come into your home are also on the same page, at least in terms of the common spaces. Maybe you can say, okay, you can keep your room however you want to, but the common areas, you know, I'm going to freak out if we have dirty dishes lying around, you know, that kind of thing. So you have that conversation before you move in and then you write down, okay, we're going to do it this way. That's why it's an agreement. You've agreed to these things. This is how you're going to live together. And, that, and then if something comes up, then you can say, look, you know, we did talk about this and, you know, let's, and you address things when they're small, you address issues when they're small, don't let them fester, you know, and uh, be kind to each other. Talk, you know, realize everyone has good intentions, but keep your sense of humor. That's always important too. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, <laughs> it's important to really um, uh, talk about issues. And that's why there's this whole questionnaire that's part of the workshop and also for members you know, how do you like to live? It covers everything from kitchen use to the music you listen to, to whether you entertain a lot, you know, pets, alcohol, smoking, those are kind of the basics. And you have to make sure you agree on these things. Oh, yeah, it's great. It's like, really, it is just like a dating site, (laughs) except in in many ways. And honestly, this questionnaire, I think it'd be great for couples that are thinking about getting married should go through the same thing. That's what it sounds like. Now, when do you think if somebody was in their 50s, and, you know, just kind of went like they're listening right now and they're going, oh, this is interesting. What could you start to think about earlier than you're mm-hmm. planning to do this? What would be a yeah. useful way to think? Well, certainly you have to think about your home in a new way, your house, because if depending on how many years you've lived there, you may have raised your kids there and it's full of memories and it's full of stuff. <laughs> so on, yes. on both fronts, you really need to, uh, you know, to, to see your home in a new way and see it as making space for something new in your life. And there is some downsizing involved because you may have things that you've been holding on to for a long time that you don't need. Uh, it's a heck of a lot easier than if you're having to downsize to a condo apartment and get rid of everything and in a hurry. I mean, and you don't want to do right. this when you're rushed. But um, yeah, actually, I just one brief story about where I'm living now um, because of life happens and things change and move along and it, I had to find someplace else to live. And I was talking with um, uh, some friends who had a home and they said, well, we do have some space, but you know, it's full of all our stuff. And you know, my wife has said, you know, we can't do anything until you know, I clean up my stuff. So I said, okay, fine. You know? And then I said, you know, if I was living there, I would, you'd have extra income and you could hire somebody to help you handle all this stuff that you've got. So a couple of days later, well, I think the wife had said it that to me, oh, I'd love that, you know. <laughs> so uh, we talked, and uh, a couple of days later, I had an email actually from one of the uh, uh, downsizers that I know through real estate, because a lot of people need that kind of service. And she said, oh, I have an appointment set with these folks. And then a couple of days after that, I had a call from them saying, okay, you can move in. Wow. So I was just so touched that they would take that step, you know, to make space for me. But they did. Wow. So to think about space in a different way and to look at your stuff and start to think, hmm, maybe it's time to think about downsizing in advance, yeah. <laughs> downsizing yeah. the stuff. Yeah. And you don't have to downsize your whole house. You know, you just have to make space for like clear editing room. Some people want to rent a space furnished. So you might even consider that as an option. In my case, um, the space that I moved into was furnished. So I had to put a lot of my furniture in storage. But then after I'd been here for a year, um, I said to my, my, uh, my housemates, I said, look, uh, you know, I'd love to get my furniture out of storage. And if we could find a new home for this bedroom furniture that I've been using, then I could pay you more rent. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I was able to do that. So now everything is out of the storage unit and they found a new home for all the furniture that I've been using. But your stuff must really be quite contained. Uh, yeah, over time, because every time I've, I've, changed homes, which has been a number of times over the years. I think this last, the 20 years I spent with these two women was really the longest. Um, Yeah. So I've downsized over time. So when you move in, are you usually just moving a bedroom and or office? Is that typically what happens? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Basically. I mean, as it happens, the couch that I'm sitting on, I did bring with me and that I had thought I'd have to get rid of it, but they had room in the family room that that we're sharing basically because I had their pool tables over to my right. But they always ask, can we play pool this afternoon? I say, oh, sure, because I'm mostly here just when I'm doing something like this or in the evenings, I sometimes watch TV in here. Hmm. But uh, yeah, so it all fits in. Wow, this is awesome. So what would you recommend for somebody, if somebody's listening right now and they're like, you know what, I'm pretty serious about this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how old they are. They like the idea 
of home sharing versus downsizing or having like a a rental, like a strict rental agreement where somebody is just living in a room. What would you say they do immediately? Well, do you, you know, research, there's books on my website. Uh, I think even Amazon may have some, some books to read up on it. Attend a workshop. I do workshops once a month, which goes what's your, over. what's your website? I'm going to post it in the notes, but what is okay. it? Okay. Yeah. Golden home sharing connections.ca. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. And I would imagine even if you're not in Canada, there's still plenty of amazing information in your workshop. Uh, yes, indeed. The, the workshop's absolutely available for people that are from the States or anywhere, really. Um, at just, this not point, the ma- just not the matching service. Just not the matching service. The matching right. service is in Canada. I might ex- at some point expand that into the States. I had some thoughts about that, but I'm not quite there yet. But the workshop and the information, absolutely. Wow, this is really fun. Like I, I, don't even, I don't even know exactly what to think about it because it's just, it's so interesting. Well, that's what I'm thinking about it. It's unbelievably interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the start. That's a start. (laughs) Yeah, I really think that. And it does also feel like it's probably more appealing for women. Am I making that up? No, I think you're right. Uh, You'll see on my website, I started out with Golden Girls Canada, and I put a little umlaut and and guys, because there's no reason that men can't do this. And I think that came out because I did a presentation to the the seniors task force in our our town. And one of the town councillors who was there, a guy said, you know, you say this is for both men and women, but it looks like it's just for women. So I said, okay. So for him, I added, and guys, no reason why not. But I've, I've, heard, I've heard that the stress response that we all hear about of uh, fight or flight is actually based on a male model. And that women, when they're under stress, they're more likely to go to tend and befriend. And that to me goes back to caveman days when the men went out to fight the saber-toothed tiger and the women got all the kids together to make sure everybody was safe. Yeah, I love that. And another thing I really like about what you're doing is that it, it came so naturally from a passion of yours. And I'm always pointing that out on the podcast that, you know, so many of us get confused when we have a wake up call or we hit a milestone and we're like, ugh, I don't know, something's missing. I want something that's more meaningful, but I don't really know what my passion is. I hear that so often. And I always say, you're probably on the right path now. You just don't see it. And that's exactly what happened with you. You started out in architecture, then you started doing some consulting, you ended up in real estate. And then this idea came to you that was related to all of that. Your passion came through. And if you look at what was consistent with everything you've always done, it's centered on community and making community better and bringing community together. And there it is. Yeah, you're it's, absolutely right. I, I'm just so pleased that this is where my life is at right now. <laughs> I know. I love it. And when did you start this business, this part of your your journey? Yeah, I launched the website in, let's see, this is 2021. I think the end of 2018 is when I, I launched the website. And of course, I realized right away that I had to start publicizing it. So um, that's when I, I started well, like doing workshops and also doing, I have a presentation for any, any groups and especially on Zoom. This can be done across North America too. Oh my gosh, just Dorothy. In- Dorothy, how old, how old were you when you started this, go- this golden? Uh, I was about 70. Golden Girls Canada, 70. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I want to make sure that we pause on that for a second and say, 70, you started an online business that was directly related to your passion that involved all kinds of technology at 70. Uh, yep, that's what <laughs> I did. <laughs> that is amazing. So many of us are hesitant about technology and online business. And you've had to, you came up with the idea, you figured out how to create the database, you hired whoever you had to hire, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. And And then you had to focus on marketing and getting the word out there. And uh, I think that's amazing. And again, not only were you on the right path all along, but it's never too late. Nope. Nope. As long as you've got your, you know, your your gift of of health and energy and yeah, enthusiasm, you know, age has nothing to do with that. Age has nothing to do with it. I love it. Final words. Oh my goodness. Um, Well, I just trying to tell the world that, Home sharing is affordable, it's very viable, and it's a very enjoyable way to live. Oh, that's beautiful. Dorothy, thank you so much for joining us today on The Women in the Middle. I think 
You've given everybody something to think about and consider another option, another flexible opportunity for us as we go into our next chapter. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm going to put all your links on the summary notes. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Susie. Okay, that's it for this episode. Pretty interesting, right? I love how Dorothy basically created a dating site with a home sharing twist. (laughs) That's basically it. And I also love it when women follow their passion to find a fulfilling way to make a professional contribution. Indeed, she was always on the right path. And I have a feeling that you are too. I see this time and time again. There are so many important clues in your life about your passion and the way that you love to contribute. So if you're in a career funk, you don't have to feel so alone. You don't have to feel so confused and you don't have to feel so trapped. I can help you stop waiting and start moving forward. Head over to www.clearoncareer.com and join us in this new group coaching program. Enrollment is now open. If you're not listening in real time, just get on the wait list because we will open again soon. For show notes and links, go to www.coachwithsusie.com. And to get a copy of my new book, 50 Ways to Celebrate Life After 50, check out Amazon or your favorite online bookseller or go to www.50waystocelebrate.com. Let's do this, ladies. It's time for you to put yourself first. Life is too short to waste time feeling stuck. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.